Greetings, everyone. It is the 27th of August. Delighted to have you here for the People-Centered Internet Community Call. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, a both a guest and a community member with us today, Mark Prinsky. Mark is the author of, most recently, Empowered. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the things that he wrote about there, how he's advanced his thinking uh, to get young people more involved in uh, in doing, and Mark is uh, uh, a has been an active uh, participant in our calls uh, for a couple of years now, and we're delighted to have him uh, with us today. I'll remind uh, that one of the claims to fame to uh, Mark's background is he coined the terms uh, digital native, digital immigrants, and since we're all uh, I consider ourselves all natives here. Um, we're going to have uh, you know good questions, all right, for what he's going to share with us uh, today. If you have questions, put them into chat. Uh, if uh, you, when we get to the Q and A, maybe thirty minutes from now, you know, you can also use the reactions function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's a little smiley face, all right, and you can raise your hand, and I'll uh, call on you as you ask questions, both in chat and in person. So. Mark, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. I'm going to share my screen, uh, which let's do it this way. And we go to the beginning of the presentation, if we can. Uh, why doesn't it do that? Hang on a second. I'm going to not share my screen. Uh, I'm going to check the presentation first. That's my little narration. I love this narration. Well, uh, that was a preview. Yes, that was a coming attraction. <laughs> oh, you got you got to escape and then a trailer. You have to start it. I got a trailer exactly. Okay, now I can go to share my screen. Hello, everybody again. There you okay. go. I'm going to talk about the future of young people. And I'm going to talk for about uh, 20 minutes and then uh, show you a whole bunch of examples. And hopefully we can have a good conversation at the end. I think that our common goal, I hope we all agree that our common goal is to prepare all our young people for the future life that they will have to be successful in that future world, not in the past worlds or not even the world of today. Um, the but the interesting thing is that the solution of most people to do that is just to update learning in advance. Today, a great many are disappointed and sick by our current system, which is years of learning in advance. That's the education in the entire world. It is spending years, 6, 12, 20 in my case, sitting in classrooms, learning in advance. And that's really the only means we have. It's school. We used to have more apprenticeships and other things, but now we just have learning in advance. And when they don't like learning in advance, most people's solution is to just update it. They do stuff like STEM and STEAM and social emotional and technology and pedagogies. But all of this is just updating learning in advance. And it's like putting icing on a cake when the cake is stale. It's incremental changes. That's the icing on the chain. And guess what? The problem doesn't get better. It gets worse, as our, our good friend Kurt keeps reminding us. And the reason I finally concluded that it gets worse is that the real problem underneath actually is all those years of sitting in classes learning in advance. That is in fact the problem, not for everybody, but for an awful lot of young people. And I think the world needs a better way to prepare and equip young people for their future. And Obama, curiously enough, knows just what it is. Just learn how to get stuff done. So that's what we need to do, but our school system and our education system doesn't do it. In learning advance, there's no getting stuff done. It's all academic learning for someday. There's no real world accomplishing. There's no positive impact on the world at all. 
In fact, it works for only some. Obviously, it does work for some, but it works for only some. It's academic, and often people find it boring. It certainly takes a long time to do. But even more, today it's on demand in more and more people's pockets. Everything that we do in school is on demand in your pocket when you actually need it, as so many people, adults now and young people, are finding out from YouTube. But the real killer is that nobody learns to get stuff done and nothing real world gets accomplished. And as a result, when young people get into the workforce, they start at the very bottom because they can't accomplish anything. Nobody gives them responsibility to do that because they haven't learned it in all that time they spent growing up. So I'm thinking, and I've been thinking for a long time about reframing an alternative. What else could we do? And to do that, I think it's important that we start not by thinking about the future of education. And a lot of people are thinking about that. There are conferences every day and there are webinars every day on the future of education. But what we're not thinking about is the future of young people. And education as we knew it may or may not play a role in that future. The real question is how should our young people grow up? How should we prepare our young people in this new age that we're in? And I see a powerful alternative for preparing young people emerging. And what I've been doing is trying to curate it. I didn't invent it, I'm trying to curate it. And that alternative is to empower young people from the very start when they're very young to get stuff done and have impact. And that's a better solution for a great many young people, not to spend all those years in school learning in advance. My son went to the best high school in California right next door to me and he hated every minute of it. Instead, what they need, many of them, is to become empowered and they should grow up empowered. And I think young people can do that all over the world. The components of that are empowerment, accomplishment, and impact. And what do we mean by that? Empowerment is the beliefs. I can, I choose, I accomplish, I see the positive impact. Accomplishment is going out and actually fixing problems, realizing things that you dream about and helping others and the impact is that you create things that you can actually point to as being better. It's before and after. See that? Before, it was not that good or it was bad. Now, because of what my team did and I did over this past project, it's much better as you can see. And the whole thing is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. In the 20th century, we all know how important learning in advance was. One of the main reasons is that information was just scarce, and teachers were scarce in many places. So you had to show up and get this learning in advance in order to do anything. But today, things are different. It's not meeting everybody's needs. The information is available elsewhere. It's very academic. There's no accomplishment. So what can we do? We can enhance it, we can reform it, we can offer an alternative. Enhancing it by adding more technology or games or all this stuff is just doing the old stuff in new ways. Reforming it, revising the curriculum and pedagogy, which is trying to happen in lots of probably every country in the world, is really addressing the wrong problem because the problem is accomplishment. So the alternative, which is to empower young people versus accomplishment, is really our best option. And today, empowerment, accomplishment, and impact, unfortunately, don't happen in our schools. They don't happen in very many schools anywhere. It's very occasional. So we need an alternative. And I have come up with a name for that. I didn't invent it. It was a 20-year-old young person who invented it, this name of empowerment hubs, a different kind of place than school. It's an alternative. It, in some cases, an adjunct. Possibly it's the long-term successor to academic learn in advanced schools. 
with the learning coming just in time as you need it. So we've stood up the Global Institute for Empowerment, Accomplishment, and Impact by young people. And our mission is to empower all of those 2 billion young people in the world. There's somewhere between 2 and 3 billion to get stuff done and have impact while they are still young and from the very start by creating these empowerment hubs. And we're in the process of creating them and, have, and helping people who are creating them on their own separately from us because we think we can get the paradigm of raising young people. We can move it from teaching young people predetermined curricula in advance, which is what we've been doing, putting them in classrooms, to empowering the young people by giving them more free choice of what they want to accomplish that's positive and doing it in the world in real time. So the ways we get there, we create these empowerment hubs, we have all the young people doing continuous real-world projects about things they care about. We offer them far more self-knowledge because really today a lot of kids won't don't even know what they're passionate about or what their strengths are. They can't tell you, but we need to help them understand their dreams and their strengths and their passions so they act on those. And finally, we don't use ed tech because ed tech, which is so big in the world these days, is just more learning in advance. I've come up with an idea for Empotech. Empotech are ways to use all the new devices and internet and YouTube and connections and AI that we have to empower people, like doing projects around the world, time zone to time zone, like they do in software and creating teams of young people internationally. So in empowerment hubs, young people do continuous world improving projects that they choose, each having a measurable positive impact on the world. Young people realize their dreams, fix problems they care about and help others. And it reinforces better beliefs because the belief that young people have now, many of them that are reinforced often by adults is I can't until, of course, I finish school, and hopefully then I can. But the new belief is I can, I choose to, I accomplish, and I see the positive results, and I do it now. There's an alternative and an opt-in where and what from classrooms and educational technology and things that you can use online to empowerment hubs both online and in person, where you can do these projects with guidance of experts who know how to do these things. The benefits, they're huge. We more effectively prepare all our young people to get things done. We create young people who are happier, more engaged and energized because they're doing things that they want to do. And we all get a continuously improving world because they're doing real world projects. And it works for everyone. It's not just the people who love school or who wanna to go to school. Every young person can figure out some project that they want to do that benefits the world in some way and then get it done. And there's more because it's already starting. The buds of empowerment hubs already exist in the world, in pockets. They need to be cultivated and encouraged. And that's why we've set up this Global Institute for Empowerment, Accomplishment, and Impact, an action-oriented R&D group whose mission is to help institutions, politicians, and parents better prepare young people for their future by helping create empowerment hubs, helping run them. They don't, it's not a, a proprietary name. It's not a brand name. It's a generic term for this different kind of education than learning in advanced schools. So I want to spend the rest of the time showing you examples of so many things that have already been done in the world that could be done. 
And I'll start by saying there's two kinds of ways this can happen. Young people can originate the projects, and that's what they're doing in this group I, we work with called Design for Change that's in 60 countries. And the projects can come from companies or challenges or other things. And I just came across a company called District C that's going into companies and getting challenges for the young people to do. It's not the same as PBL, project-based learning. It's real projects. That's very important to understand. PBL is really just another pedagogy for learning in advance. We're talking about real projects with a measurable positive impact on some aspect of the world besides just the people on the team. So here are some projects. You may have read about this one recently. This is a team of young people that successfully sued the state of Montana for not taking climate action. They finally got positive impact. They've been at this for five years in many states, but they finally did it. Some of you may have read the book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind in Malawi, spelled wrong there. Uh, this dreamer and his team used wind power to electrify his village. He had this dream that he could bring electricity. He got his friends to help him build this tower. He went to junkyards, got the equipment he needed, and actually electrified the whole village. In Spain, they started very young, three-year-olds figured that they couldn't reach. They had a problem. They couldn't reach those high garbage bins on the poles. They said, we want bins at our height. They designed the bins. They met with the mayor of the town. They got the bins installed. Now imagine if you can start doing and having this impact at age three, what is it like if you do 100 or 200 projects by the time you're age 20? You will certainly be more ready for work. In Colombia, the young people saw tires burning and that bothered them. So they took the tires and made them into furniture that they started selling. In India, a group in a school had, was distracted because they had the smell of urine all the time in their school because it wasn't cleaned up properly. They built urinals by cutting down water bottles and then they installed them and the smell went away. In the U.S., a team of middle school girls figured out how to hand 3D print prosthetic hands. And it's not so hard to figure out because all the plans, 3D plans, are on a site called Enable. And they built the hands. They went out and found the young people who needed the hands. And they held handathons to give the hands, prosthetic hands, to the young people. And this happens in fact, now all over the world. In Hawaii, this team of empowered young people cleaned up an island that had been bombed out in World War II with target practice. Now, if the young people can start fixing the islands, well, what about places like Lahaina? Why don't we get all the young people involved in rebuilding that? And the young people who live not just on, oh, on Maui, but in all Hawaii and all the islands in the world, we can connect them now. In India, they have a lot of beggars in the streets. This team of empowered people went out to the beggars and said, if you have a job, will you take it? And then they found them jobs. And this made the paper, as lots of these projects do. In the U.S., this team got bothered by styrofoam, and they figured out a way to turn it into activated carbon filters, which are in, pro in production. In Bhutan, the problem was very different. The kids couldn't get safely to school. They would slide down the hill or not get up the hill. So the team built a safe way to get to the school. In Brazil, Birds were being captured, rare birds, and put into cages and sold. And this team said, no, we don't think that's a good idea. Let's take the cages and make them into free libraries with books and put them all over the country. In the U.S., this is related to 4-H. This project was for young people who had a barnyard with animals, and the animals were unhappy. They had no places to play or move they designed and built a better barnyard. In India, they were not just upset that crafts were disappearing. 
they figured out how to do the crafts, and then they figured out how to teach the crafts to other people. In Denmark, where there's a lot of remote places, this team said, well, we want garbage bins around the country, but they fill up. So they used sensors to monitor when the bins were filled so they could be replaced, emptied. In Taiwan, they're doing something that we all should be doing. When we have refugees come to our country, the young people are helping them understand the culture and get welcomed and acclimatized to the new country. In India, they're going to scrapyards and creating science materials. This is one of my favorites. In the US, this team of brothers and sisters had the cops come to their house one night in, I think they're in Decatur, Decatur, Georgia. And the cops, it was a total mistake, but the cops insisted on putting them through the system and checking their backgrounds and they were not happy. They created an app called 50, which is a Yelp for police encounters, where if you have a police encounter, you can rate that encounter and they can compare then cities and countries or states and places where the police may be different. Here, a team of young journalists found out that their principal suspected that their principal had faked her resume. And they did investigative journalism. They found it was true and they got a new principal. In Africa, they have learned about vertical farms. So they came in and I heard this from one person who runs an empowerment hub called Nooks. They said they heard about it. The next day they came in and started building them. In Singapore, they've started automating the vertical farms. The young people even go out and fill the potholes in some cases when the government is not stepping up to do it. They feed people. This is bees in the US, but around the world, people are creating organic farms or new ways of farming to feed the people around them. College students, this team of college students created a football, a soccer ball that captures the energy of kicks. So it can be used later to power devices and heat and light homes. And this team just built a saddle, uh, a CubeSat that went into space to clean up junk. And then it self-destructed. It's a wonderful thing, a huge team of which this is only a part. And of course, we all know Sweden, starting with Greta Thunberg, this team of empowered people created a whole worldwide student movement for climate action. So young people can do all this stuff. We just don't give them enough opportunities. But now the new alternative is clear. It needs curation, it needs R&D, it needs encouragement, it needs lots of work, cultivation to become the universal option for young people that it should be. Not for everybody necessarily, but for those who don't like sitting in class and learning in advance for years and years. That's why we stood up the Global Institute for Empowerment, Accomplishment and Impact by Young People. It's a part of what we started earlier, the Two Billion Kids Project. There are between two and three billion young people in the world. We have founders from around the world. Kiran Sethi is in India. She started Design for Change. Uh, David Engel is a former superintendent of schools in three districts in the US. Nevi Segovia runs a group of schools in Europe and owns a university in Madrid. And there's me. And our partners, Design for Change, SEK International Schools, Riverside School, we're more and more of them, we're finding people have interest in doing this. So what we seek is more adherence, more people who think that in fact, learning in advance is the problem. They see the issue as we do and they wanna create an alternative. We're looking for partners because lots of people are doing this already and we wanna help them do it. We want to bring them under an umbrella where we can all work together and benefit. And we're seeking funders not just any funders, but those who see the issue as we do, those who don't just want to incrementally improve education, but those who want to provide a viable alternative for all young people. So 
if you agree that learning in advance no longer works well for a lot of kids and lies at the root of the problem, if you want to be part of creating a different and better for many alternative as a universal option, if you want to help curate and nurture the emergence of empowerment hubs everywhere as a viable option for young people, boy, do we want to hear from you. And we think we can make your life a whole lot better and improve the life of hopefully up to 2 billion kids. So if you want to do that, here's how to contact us. Thank you. It was great presenting to you. Yeah. Fantastic. Mark, if you'll uh, put that uh, contact information into the chat at some point, yep. that would be uh, fantastic. Um, thanks for sharing those thoughts with us. Uh, ben, you were very uh, prolific while Mark was uh, uh, presenting oh, today. So chat. we certainly are going to start with you. All right. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about uh, what Mark's suggesting here? Uh, well, I think my... <clears throat> My uh, comments that I have are uh, are plentiful and they're all uh, uh, supplemental to it uh, because I'm in uh, a complete agreement with Mark on on so many dimensions of concerned about the issue that we're confronting institutions that are in place that have a vested interest in in uh, preserving their legacy practice and accreditation assertive accreditation. And so it's, it is important to work as those institutions evolve to align and augment them as we historically have in the past, the things like Boy Scouts, Explorer Scouts, Girl Scouts, and uh, 4-H and other initiatives that, that we have had in the past were supplemental and on the side. Uh, that offered uh, avenues of achievement and personal development. Apprenticeship notions in professions have had things like that as well. I don't want to go to war with the institutions, although I do want to defeat them. And, and so uh, it, it's just uh, my comments are, are really in support of that, Okay, Mark. Well, thank you. And, and I, I, when you said you don't want to go to war, I remember uh, Sun, Sun Tzu is all war is deception, right? So, um, the you're absolutely right that this I'm curating this. I'm not inventing this. This is already happening. I just noticed it happening at 4-H scouts, boys and girls clubs. All these things have been doing real world projects for years and years. And anybody who's ever done real world projects with young people will tell you how effective they are and how good they are and how much they work and how much they, the kids, the young people enjoy them. And it's really a pleasure to watch this thing. The Design for Change brings people from 60 countries around the world together every year for a, a world festival. And it's all young people presenting and on stage and working with each other. And it's absolutely amazing. And young people, of course, of all ages. So so I and and there are schools and and Kevin pointed out to me recently that there's a school near him, a, a college that does some of this. And there's a lot of college and university professors who say, I do projects in my classes. One big difference that I found is that the projects have to be real world. So just getting to a presentation, which often yeah. happens, I wrote a report, we did this, and then they say, oh, we found a solution. That's half. I can, I choose. Then you have to accomplish and be able to see the result. And that's what's new and different. And it's different, in my view, because the young people are now so much more empowered. Now they have so many more things in their pocket that they can work with, that they can learn from if they need to learn to do a project, that they can use to build things like apps to have the project done. And they also have better attitudes than young people in the past. Yeah, and uh, let me just add that all those assets I mentioned about the Boy Scouts and 4-H and all that are great, but they're also diminishing as an opportunity uh, portfolio. 
and not being replaced. And uh, there are many of us, and certainly in my classes, for example, a class I, I'm starting this week, the, the students will be developing LLMs for particular uh, activities within the university and outside as well. And a standalone, not, not just leveraging chat GPT on, and monolithic LLMs, they're, they're actually building from their own corpus and isolated and learning by that. The last thing I wanted to mention was the notion of the uh, uh, global clock that as you were talking about, uh, in the case of Ford Motors, uh, <clears throat> some years ago started projects that they were handed off every eight hours. Uh, they moved with the sunlight. Wherever the sun was coming up, the project moved to that venue. And so your hubs are individual islands with local focus and local and regional needs, but they're also a part of an archipelago that can be a, a living and continuous action. Thank you. That's that's fabulous. Because I've thought that for years, that business actually has a bunch of these things that fall under what I call empotech, that ways to use technology that really empowers people. And working around the world 24 hours is one of those working in multiple teams and all the things that people have built up. Uh, Kevin, you mentioned that you were in a virtual uh, presentation or uh, whatever it was that was from Motorola or some company. Uh, this doesn't exist in the schools. This doesn't exist for young people. And it's really a shame. And even if it existed in one place in a city, then the young people could go there and they could do this. So there's a huge amount of technology that isn't getting to the young people that they could really use. Now, the technology they have, they're trying to invent it. But I think that Greta, for example, Greta Thunberg has not even gone very far to where she could be going. Because if she wants to get the, the students involved in climate change and get the adults motivated to do something, just having a strike on a few Fridays, even if it's in a lot of places, is not enough. What she could do is get every, or ask at least, every student in the world who has a phone to not go to school permanently until something got done for climate change. Now, suppose she organized that, which she's perfectly capable of doing, and the kids actually did it, the young people did it. That would be so disruptive that it would really start to create some movement possibly for change. So, or we got politicians who just, she said, okay, I don't want any politicians, young kids going to school, children going to school until the politician does something. And boy, that would make a difference. So the kids, the young people, I keep saying kids, but it's really young people have much more power today than they give themselves credit for. And they are not even aware very often of the level and the amount of power that they have. And so part of our initiative is not only to collect all these groups and work with the 4-H and the scouts and the boys and girls clubs and, and the, those people who are already doing this, but also to help the young people become more aware of who they are as individuals and what their power is collectively in this new world they're in. So, Mark, um, we have a, a hand up. I'm going to go to that hand in a moment. Um, an observation. The um, I think in the design of, of education as we currently understand it would be to suppress the urge that you're suggesting that we need to rediscover, right? Which is that um, you're not ready for prime time until you're finished with all of this formal, you know, uh, training, right? To, you know, get ready to do something. Um, we also have, at least in, in some countries, it's not universal, uh, child labor laws to prevent you from getting involved in doing things, right? So the, do you have any perspective on what might need to legally change about the way that we understand what 
younger people uh, can do at the same time, you know, the, the reason that those laws came into existence is that we didn't want, you know, really young people, you know, getting their arms cut off in machinery, right? So the, you know, at, at the turn of the century when we started to, you know, have, uh, you know, factories. So where's the balance? Well, absolutely. And and there are, there are, I can address both of those things. So the first thing that we need to do legally is just allow more options. And we uh, there was a huge fight, obviously, in the U.S. for charter schools. Um, they exist, but even when they exist, they still have to follow all the school rules. So they really just become a different kind of context for doing the same thing. In Spain, you're not allowed, I just heard, to homeschool your kids. This needs to be the if if there's no room to do these options full time in place of school, assuming that they do the trick that we want them to do, they won't do the same thing, but they'll maybe do something better. So that that's the first place that legality might work. The second that you talked about child labor laws, those were so that young people wouldn't get exploited or hurt or harmed, as you as you mentioned. But most of the work today is intellectual. Most of the things that these young people are doing in these other projects, some of it's physical and when they don't have it, as soon as they get the tools, it becomes intellectual. They start using the capabilities that they have to do this, which isn't exploitative at all. It's something that they want to do. And if you look at it cynically, what you just described, the reluctance of the education system to do this can be seen as another act the Educator Full Employment Act, that you need the education before you can do anything. And that's really just not right. Okay, very good. Uh, I see uh, PCI host, which I believe is Schneider. Are you with us, Schneider? Yeah, that's 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 me. So yeah, I, Schneider Alfonso, I, glad to have you with us. <laughs> yeah, my question is actually very related to, or it's quite related to what, uh, Kevin already asked, and is a uh, mark of, I mean, in my experience, I also have this point of a journey as a young person and working more, more on the practice, right? Like more pragmatic, even though I have my university uh, degree or whatever. But when I think about young people now making decisions about their career or the future path, etc., how to go, majority of them, uh, and I would say also happened to me, they decide to go to university to get a degree because it's the safest thing, right? So my question is, do you think at some point, based on this evolution or progress in terms of how do we conceive career, et cetera, a degrees or these certificates will become obsolete or, yeah, because your your empowerment hubs, and, and I think that, as you say, they already exist in different ways and we are living in different ways, but... How about those certificates and those degrees that people just care about and where you think also about maybe having a more secure path in terms of work or employment? You think, well, I need to get one of those just to be able to, you know, like even play after. If I want to be an entrepreneur, et cetera, it is a backup to have a, a, a certificate or a degree. How do you think? Uh, yeah, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. That's a really important question that that obviously some people want the security. And I think the two are parallel. I don't think that that the academic education will ever die out. We need academics. We need the kinds of research that academics do. Um, yes, Ben, I agree. We do. But but we but that doesn't work for the majority of people in the world. The number of people, young people in the world who become academics is probably minuscule compared to the number of people there are. So that's a path for some. And it's uh, often a path that, that wealthy people or, or upper class people are pushed into by their parents. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. There's a lot of unhappy doctors in the world and lawyers in the world. <laughs> but the, but the, uh, the other part is that it needs to, there needs to be a rethinking of what it means to be a competent adult. And somehow the academics convinced us, I, I think they just hijacked education, and they convinced us that a competent adult is somebody who's been through all these years of what I call the mess, math, 
English, science, social studies, or put in whatever language you want. And that's not what makes somebody a competent adult. It may be part of it. What makes somebody a competent adult is having a lot of experience at getting things done. And the motivation for getting things done is that you want to do them, that they're in your area of interest, that they're in your area of passion. That's the motivator. And if you do that, so I just see this as a really a kind of a no-brainer if I were starting from scratch. If there were no schools in the world and we, we wanted to figure out a way, we said, okay, we have these young people, a great majority of them are becoming very empowered with technology. The rest are following up when they can. What would we do with these people to prepare them for the future? Greenfield. And I don't think it would be school that we would invent. I think that school was invented by some very smart but interested people in ideas and in thinking, and that's fine. And we can have schools that are totally devoted to thinking, but they don't all have to be. They can be devoted to accomplishment. They can be based on accomplishment. There will be some thinking, but the right now, we're in a situation where the academics, the thought is say, is just absolutely the main dish of education. That's what education is about. You go to classes, you get textbooks, you learn these things. Maybe there are more pedagogies than textbooks today, but that's what it is. And then if you do a project or two, oh, well, that's nice. That's a great dessert. And there's lots of now more and more teachers who are doing some of this dessert putting kids into projects, some of which are even real world like Ben. But we want the opposite. Why shouldn't it be that the main meal is accomplishment? The main meal is doing these things over and over and over again, different projects that you care about, that really make the world better, that become more and more sophisticated as you do more of them, and that have a measurable positive impact on the world. And then if you need to learn something for these projects, that's dessert. That's fine because then you will pull it. Direct instruction only works well when somebody asks for it. And then it works fine. If you say, teach me how to do this, then somebody can teach you how to do that. But it doesn't work well if you throw the people or you herd the people into a classroom and say, this is what we are going to teach you. And so I, I think it can be much, much, much better designed. Yeah. So I, I'm i going to uh, betray how old I am, all right, um, by saying uh, that when I was in junior high and high school, um, we had shop classes. I learned carpentry. I learned how to, you know, I don't think I could work on my car today because a lot of the stuff's all sealed up, all right? So it's different, but plumbing, electrical work, you know, rudimentary stuff, I'm capable of doing it myself because I learned it in high school, all right? And then um, had enough of a taste in adjacent home economics classes, which were not gender specific, at least where I went to school, that learning how to balance your checkbook, learning how to buy an insurance policy, learning how to cook your own meal, all right, were in bounds, right? And they're absent from a lot of the curriculum today. Um, we we stopped because those were all hands-on. They were kinesthetic, right? Um, and while they were part of an academic experience and, and part of school, I think that what you're having some difficulty with, Mark, is that a lot of that stuff has gone away, right? And so, you know, the, the result is you don't have the ability to do. I mean, I, I literally brought stuff home that I made that we used in the house, right? Because, you know, I made a chair, right, um, in, in shop class, right? Here, you know, here, here's a new piece of furniture, guys. Here's a coffee table, all right? Just, just made it. Um, you know, th those skills, you know, allow me to keep up with repairing and maintaining my own home, 
today, right? And I think that a lot of people are incapable of doing that because they're not getting those skills, right? So I simply put out to you, in addition to solving global problems, there's a certain amount of, you know, just having my own capacity, you know, to be able to do things on my own, right, that I think is also absent from the experience that younger people are going through today. Uh, they might get it from their parents. They might get it from someone else. But I don't think that they're getting it from, you know, the the way that we, you know, potentially educate or prepare people today. So what do you think about that? I agree. There's uh, the uh, one thing you can say about that. So my kid just left the gun high school, which is this fancy academic uh, public school in California. And he could have taken an automotive course, but he had no pressure. He had, the pressure was the other way to not take that. He mm -hmm. took a business course. Guess mm -hmm. what? That's not a core subject. So when he goes to school, that 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 stuff gets disregarded compared to the mess, the math, uh, you know, English mm -hmm. science and social studies. That's one thing. Second thing is interests are much broader than the few courses that they can offer in a school. Mm -hmm. So it's just like when we say, "What's your favorite subject?" We it's a five choice, multiple choice test. Right. Suppose a kid is interested in X or Y or Z or horses or satellites or all this kind of there can't be a course for everybody. But what there can be is a place. And the makerspace was an attempt at this, which unfortunately didn't produce um, uh, really useful things necessarily. But that's the idea is to say you get to work on something that improves the world in some way. And it could be a chair in your family and it could be a road in Bhutan and it could be a parking right. lot and it could be a satellite. And that and and the second part of that is, guess what? That's your main meal, because what you're talking about is, yeah, we did that stuff. But it was kind of dessert. It was those that was the course that I liked, right? That was the one time in the day when I could get my hands on something and do this. The rest of it wasn't about that. And what I think is there should be there really should be an option. If you want to be intellectual, if you want to go down the academic path in any direction, absolutely, it should be there, and it is there. But if you are a person like this, so many kids who want to drop out, they just, this is not for me. I don't want to go down this path. I don't think I need to go down the academic path in order to succeed in my life doing the kinds of things I want to do. There really is not an option for that these days. Yeah. yeah. So I don't see anybody's hand up. I'm going to look in here in, in chat. I think that oh, I have, um, you know, some more good commentary from Ben. Uh, so are you familiar with, um, you know, the, uh, Davos, right? Which is, uh, what is that world economic forum? I've been, has a, has a YGL young global leaders program. So mm -hmm. it's for, you know, I, I think it's for people who are like 20 to maybe, 35 or I, I don't know exactly what the age band is, but you know, th th they have a definition for what, why, you know, why GL is. Maybe there is an opportunity to say, okay, do the next band lower, right? For what you, because, you know, the, the one that you're targeting is the people who are, you know, currently involved in, enterprise and government, you know, they're, they're early in their career. Can you do something, you know, World Economic Forum for the, the people who are preparing to become careerists, all right? You know, get them involved, pick some topics, um, you know, get some involvement, right, across some of the things that you were pointing out, all right, because they have resources, right, that, and that they have you know, agenda creating attention as a as an influencer group, and you could pick some others. I, I'm picking on them just because they get spotlighted. You know, once you you could pick the Aspen Institute, all right, and say, what are you doing for really young people, uh, younger people during your Ideas Festival, all right, during the summer, all right, Aspen Institute. You know, 
uh, you could do those kinds of challenges, right? So I, I just suggest, you know, that those might be resource providers and agenda setters for you. Uh, I, that's a fabulous idea. And and what it goes back to for me is that I was just talking with somebody the other day who listened to what I said, and he said, you, well, you, you shouldn't even be thinking about education. What you're thinking about is work. What you're thinking about is jobs. You're talking about preparing young people to work. And, and education is just, the, those are the wrong people to be talking to. You should be talking to civic leaders. You should be talking to other people. And what is World Economic Forum? It's just sort of the, the summit of those civic leaders. So if you have any um, connections there of anybody that I can talk to, I certainly try. I've been there not as a participant, but as a hanger on. And the uh, and it, you meet a lot of great people. There are a lot of great people there. So hopefully uh, that's a, that's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, Kevin. I mean, what you need is a champion to bring that in and say, here, you got to listen to Mark for a second. Right. And at any rate, uh, I see Doug Hoolan. You have turned your camera on. You have some uh, thoughts you'd like to share. Yes. With Sorry. Mark or on the topic. Yeah, sorry I came in a little bit late, um, but uh, really good talk as always, Mark. Uh, you know, I'm passionate about education as well. Um, a few thoughts is, you know, uh, you know, Gary Bowles, you know, wrote the book Next Rules of Work, and you know, how do we, you know, what what the future of work and mindset, tool set, and skill set, um, you know, which I, I find very valuable as well. Uh, you know, I think of, you know, there's 1.3 billion students in on this planet, and actually we should all be lifelong learners. We should all be lifelong students. Um, and, you know, how do we get, get uh, especially young people, motivated to learn? Uh, I remember in college, whenever we moaned about uh, getting homework, the this professor would say, education is the one commodity that once purchased, you want as little as possible. And, uh, you know, by the way, gym memberships, the same thing, right? You know, we, we sign up for gym memberships and never want to use them. Um, but, uh, you know, it's how do you give a passion, a, a desire for learning? Um, it's so critical. Um, you know, it's this, these, some of these challenges. I, I also think, uh, you know, like I, you know, I have this series of when will there be a billion of something? And like, when will there be a billion students using uh, tele? Um, teleeducations, distance learning. Um, I think that's a way to solve climate change personally to reduce uh, the amount of travel we're doing. Um, if, if, but the problem is we need to have the socialization. One of the problems with COVID is all these lockdown of students, you know, they, they were isolated. So, you know, how do you have distance learning without the uh, losing the socialization, I think is going to be one of the challenges. Um, Here, here's you know, how I would flip that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I I don't want to interrupt you if you want to no, go. No, no, please. But here's how I would flip that. A lot of people are talking about lifelong learning and lifelong students and lifelong this. No, the thrust of what I'm saying is I don't want that. I want lifelong accomplishment. And I think of climate change. If everybody in the world learned about climate change, it wouldn't change a thing unless they did something, unless they accomplished something. So the the problem is not a learning problem. The problem is an accomplishment problem. And that is what I'm, that's why we have empowerment hubs. Schools are all about the learning part and they're fine and that's good. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying it isn't enough. And I really wish that the people who keep talking about lifelong learning would start talking about lifelong accomplishing, figuring out how we can make that happen. And learning is not a prerequisite for accomplishment. It can happen while you're doing it. In fact, for most of us, that's how it works. We set out to do something. We set out to do a job. We set out to do a project. And along the way, we have to learn a bunch of things because that's what we need to get it done. But learning in advance, worldwide learning in advance, lifelong learning in advance is always in advance. It does never gets you to where you want to go. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, you know, in fact, intelligence is the uh, achieving complex goals, right? And, uh, you know, uh, is achievement, right? So just learning by its by its own sake, you know, are you achieving uh, goals, right? Are and achieving- I even distinguish between achievement and accomplishment. 
So an achievement is fine. You get to be the president of the United States. You get to be the valedictorian. You get good grades. That's an achievement. It benefits you. Accomplishment is something that benefits somebody else in the world besides you. And that's, I think, more what you're talking about. So it, I would put the word accomplishment in there and not, I, achievement is fine, but it's just too personal for me. Yeah. Oh, and I'm using Max Tagmart's uh, definition of of, of intelligence, yeah. achieving complex goals. But uh, again, it's about the goals, the accomplishments, right? Um, you know, and what 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 accomplishments do we need to in this world, right? We need to lower our carbon footprint. We need yeah. to, you know, the sustainability goals, right? How That's do we great. achieve those? And um, if you can't point to the fact that your team lowered something or did something or changed something, if there's no before and after to you to the project that you're doing, then in my book, you haven't done very much. And so uh, it's you may have learned something, you may have, uh, you know, achieved knowledge, but you haven't accomplished anything or done something useful. And there's something that I heard recently that I, I, I'll share with you because it, it meant it changed a lot of my thinking. How we all talk about uniqueness and diversity. And one of the things, what makes people unique? And some people think, well, it's, you know, it could be your skin color. It could be your eye color. It could be the way you think. It could be a lot of different things. What makes you unique as a human are the projects that you choose to do and accomplish. Did you choose to help your family? Did you choose to build satellites? Did you choose to do this? When your life is over, that's what is your uniqueness that's gonna be remembered. So the element of choice and then accomplishment is so important and it's so missing today for young people. I can, I choose, I accomplish, and I see positive results. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to make an observation, which is, I think that the system that we, we live with today was meant to overcome the ready, fire, aim problem, right? Which is that we have a tendency to want to take action, at least in this culture, Right, I'm not talking globally. In this culture, is we we want to get to, to action as quickly as possible, right? And sometimes that means that we didn't prepare enough to actually do it well. Yeah. What is possible now is just in time availability to the information you need to act, right? And it used to not be available real time. It is available real time. I mean, this is people centered internet, you know. So the the fact is. You know, our ability to potentially get to action faster, but action that is well-informed, because we're not ignoring that there's information to help guide action. That's right. It's just that we don't need to necessarily, you know, I didn't need to learn that two years ago for what I need to do right now. Yes. Right. So that's kind of the difference, right? Uh, but I think that that might be the... One it really is. Reasons. It's the OODA loop. It's it's the fact that you you need to see a problem. Think about the the methodology that works really well is is a design methodology that Design for Change invented. They call it feel, imagine, do, share. So you feel, you do the empathy, you find the problem, you figure out what the real problem is. And then you imagine what a solution would be, and then you do something. And often this is, you can start with a prototype, but then you have to get the feedback. Then you have to get the understanding, does it work? Does it do this? What else do I need to do? What else has to happen? So there really has to be that thing. And as you so rightly point out, Kevin, now we can do that instantaneously almost. So, uh, you know, we can ask chat GPT, we can do all these things as part of our process. And young people can do this as part of their process. And it doesn't have to take years and it doesn't have to be in advance. And young people often, uh, teachers I've discovered, often think that reflection is something that has to have its own time and it has to have its own place and it takes a long time and you have to write it down and all this. And I remember thinking, you know, after somebody loses a, a 
a video game, they totally reflect on what they did wrong and then they start over again. You know, so that this reflection happens um, and it can be encouraged and it should be encouraged as part of the process, but as part of the accomplishment process. Yeah. You invoked a moment ago. I, I see your hand up, Barry. I'll just finish this thought is UDA. Okay. The observe, orient, decide, act that was originally, you know, created by John Boyd. And I, you know, recommend Robert Coram's biography of this guy because he was the living embodiment of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, he um, was, you know, he, you're holding up another book, Ben. Uh, is that, is, is, is that a, I, I don't know that one. Is that a, about no, Boyd? No, no, I, I agree with the, the Boyd book is the best bio, best bio period on, on John Boyd. This is a book by one of his acolytes, okay. uh, uh, Chet Richards. Go ahead. But the point is that what you could learn in DOD classrooms, he basically said, well, that's crap. Let me, let me show you how to fly an airplane based on physics. Okay. Um, what, what, you know, we got from the aircraft manufacturers crap. Okay. So it, here is the, the way to do this. And he just kept on challenging what anyone was already saying. This is the orthodoxy. This is what you need to know. And he said, "No, that's wrong, right?" And um, that's why he, he never did, rose rose above colonel. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't very yeah. well liked by. I mean, because he wasn't particularly politically oriented. He didn't have the social skills, but he was a brilliant guy, right? And even. Um, I just point that out. Let's go to uh, Barry. Glad to have you with us. Glad to be here. Um, uh, I really uh, resonate with the, the thing about now you can figure out what you need to, to know to accomplish something fairly quickly uh, at the point where you need to uh, where you learn the where you discover that uh, you need to uh, learn something new. Um, in my day-to-day, -day, in my day job, this happens all the time. And one of the things that bugs me is that it's done badly. Okay, so so people will think, I, I, I need to learn how to do X. They'll go and do a, a few uh, Google searches about X. They won't have any uh, way to judge whether they've done a complete search or whether they've... Uh, uh, found the best ways to do something, and then they rush off and, and build something based on that, and it's often second rate, you know, nowhere near uh, what could be done. And I, I think they're missing um, in their schooling. They didn't uh, get any help with learning how to do the research uh, in the first place. Okay, so... Um, that's one thing. I have a second point I'd like to make, but Mark, why don't you respond to that first? Oh, well, you know, that's that's an interesting um, uh, thing. What, what it sounded like to me was missing in what you just talked about was some coaching. Um, that that as they they found these things, and if they could only have talked to Barry for three seconds, he could have set them straight and on the right on the right path. And that we should definitely have. I mean, that's why coaches are important. Uh, my kid learned to footnote when he was in third grade. Did they? You know, I mean, I thought that I thought that was real bullshit, right? And the uh, because someday that would help him when he got to Princeton, right, where his teacher was from. Um, the uh, we just got to figure these things out that they don't need to all be learned in advance. A great example is there's a woman, a young woman named Jatanjali Rao, who wrote a book about she invented the the water tester in for Flint, Michigan, that that you where you could actually stick uh, some things in the water and find out if there was lead. And and nobody else had that. And she invented it. Well, when she was doing that, she had to figure out how she was going to do it. She's a young kid. Uh, and and she came across carbon nanotubes as a particular 
uh, way to find the solution. So she said, well, I had to learn about carbon nanotubes. Did I need to start chemistry from the very beginning? Did I ever learn the periodic table? No, I took a course in peri you know, online in carbon nanotubes. And I talked to a bunch of people about this. So we, this, and, and I got done what I needed to do. And I never learned all that chemistry stuff. But so the uh, you're, the problem is the right is the right problem that you're talking about, but the solutions are not going back and doing the, all the learning in advance and getting this shit in. Excuse me, getting this stuff in when you're young, and and because we don't know what needs to be there. And and I'm you know as educated as the next person with all my degrees, but I there are so so many domains of human knowledge that I am totally ignorant about. I don't know anything about Chinese poetry or, or Thai history or, or any of these kind of stuff. Um, and, and you can't know everything, but what we're getting so much better at, and everybody does this now with YouTube is that when you want to know how to do something and it obviously isn't everything, but there are billions of them. Now you can go to a YouTube and find three or four people often who will tell you how to do this? My kid does this all the time to fix his car. My kid does this all the time to to um, do things, and that is a different world. That's a world where you think of learning as something as an adjunct to doing, mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking doing as an adjunct to learning. So, how do you part learn to find the right YouTube videos? How do you learn to find the right? material online that you that ask you know is the, the so when when my wife my wife is japanese and when i need to know anything japanese I, I ask her and she knows how did you learn that well i was in the online i read the online forum i'm in an online forum with other japanese women and i know all this stuff my son watches you know he he will help steer you to the youtube sort of thing it's and and we used to have a librarian be. function to do that we right. don't anymore but we could have you know, there, there are ways to get that help, but they're not the old ways of saying, how do I do research? You know, and, and that I do that for 20 years, so, you know, learn that for 20 years, and then I can someday go out and do research and write a book. No, my that's sense, my sense is there's a, there's a gap there still. Oh, well, fill it, please. It will get sorted over time, but uh, please fill it. Uh, we, uh, we there's plenty of gaps, and we have to all fill these different things, and we need to prioritize what is at the top of our pyramid for helping young people. In my case, that's what I want to do, and 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 saying if you if you don't do this, it's it's you're not going to get anywhere. If you do this, well, it really helps. Is what you just pointed out that if you also have this, that at this point you you seek a coach to help you distinguish between what you've learned and 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 falsehood. Um, so that, practice in a, in an area. Yeah, and and that's same with medicine, right? You can learn lots of things online, and I just uh, when, but and some of it may not be true, but you can then go to the next step. So I was having stomach pains, and I suddenly su suggested, su I, I suddenly started eating a lot of salad, and I had stomach pains, and I went online and I said, "Is there a connection between stomach pain and and salad?" And yes, there is. There's a very well studied connection because when you eat a lot of salad, your body has problems digesting it at first, et cetera, et cetera. So it's there. And yeah, and if somebody says, well, something else, and you get two conflicting things, then you've got to figure out how to how to resolve that. Just like when you have two doctors who who don't you know come up with the same diagnosis. How do you figure that out? And it's not because either one may not be, you know, a bad researcher. It's because certain things need sorting out. Different. Very, did did you have a second question or observation? Yeah, I, I did have a second. I've been reflecting, you know, as I approach retirement. Uh, my don't uh, retire. <laughs> well, change of what I do, shall we say? Stop working for Oracle and start <laughs> doing things for myself. Um, been reflecting on on my career path and thinking about uh, how, partly uh, because of the things that you've said in these meetings, um, reflecting on how my education played into what I've accomplished over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And it's 
um, just uh, I did a, a, a mathematics degree in Australia and then went straight into what you would describe as hands-on stuff um, by uh, working for a number of years fixing uh, mainframe computers. Um, and then I went into software. Um, and when I look back at uh, the sorts of work that I've done and how the contributions that I bring to the table compared to uh, my peers, um, a lot, I've, I've brought a lot uh, from the point of, uh, sorry, I'm not saying this clearly. One of my great strengths is my ability to abstract. Okay. And where did that come from? Well, there was four years of having continuously exercising the muscle of learning new abstractions or thinking about new abstractions when I was doing my undergraduate degree. Had, I do use the mathematics a little bit in my day, day job, but it's mostly irrelevant. But the piece that isn't was this muscle that I developed to be able to abstract things. And, and then I've applied that in many places and it's been of much value. And it doesn't fit the paradigm that you're talking about right well, now. Well, no, because not everybody's the same, and we need all of them. And and if everybody benefited, if the world benefited by everybody stretching that that the theoretical thinking muscle, would mine got got stretched as well? Then that would be one thing. But the world is full of different people. A lot of people who stretch other muscles, who stretch their getting things done muscles, who stretch their who stretch whatever it is that they have. And we need to make teams of these people. And so the the danger, especially from from um, uh, generalizing from oneself, is that we say, well, I needed this and this really helped me. And then mm -hmm. thinking, well, that will help everybody. No, what it will help is people who are like you. And how can we figure that out? And how could you have taken a test or an, an exercise when you were three or four or 10 or 12 to say you are a person who really does well at this kind of ideation and this kind of abstraction and this kind of stuff? I didn't learn until I was in my 30s from one of these tests it said people who have your profile often go into R&D. Mm. <gasps> I'd never even heard of R and D, and 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 it turns out my whole life is R and D. That's mm -hmm. what I do. So we that's another aspect of this thing is self knowledge that right. we have to get better at. Did, I, I, a personal question: Did you know Ron Wall? Did you ever know a guy named Ron Wall at Oracle? No. Okay. Um, the uh, go go see if you can work for Larry Ellison cleaning up his island. You know, uh, no, thank you. Fireproofing <laughs> his island. Um, I'm an individual contributor. There's lots of layers between me and Larry, and I like it that way. There you go. There you, well, I, I <laughs> guess that's the way a lot of people like it. The um, <laughs> yeah, I, good, I luck, good luck on what you're doing, with Larry. And uh, no, thank you. No, the reason not to the reason not to retire is because people give up to very quickly when they do, mm -hmm. and and the the answer is change you know change your career. You're absolutely right. So good luck with that. And if if you want to work with young people at all, talk to me. Now, I'm, I might suggest to you, Mark, um, that what you're doing would fall in, into the category of being a McLuhan tetradic reversal. Okay. You can look up McLuhan tetrads in Wikipedia, but what it is, is you're trying to move back to the way we used to learn, right, as humans, because we used to be in dialogue and we used to do things. We only created the system that we're part of right now where the bell rings and you need to be in this classroom, you need to sit down and listen OK, because somebody's going to talk at you for an hour and then the bell's going to ring and you're going to go someplace else. And some subject matter expert is going to sit and talk to you for an hour at you for an hour. Um, you know, a lot of the education, you know, pre. You know, uh, 19th century were conversations. Yeah. Right. And were, as we said, apprenticeships, guilds. You know, you're going to be with the person who knows how to do it. And so you're going to you're going to learn how to make that happen. We're retrieving. Right. The way that we used to learn, you know, from, 
you know, something that we burnt down uh, over a century ago. I think that's because we wanted that, factory I, workers as opposed to, you know, the the more laissez-faire interactions that we had before. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, no, I I think that's that's fair. I don't know, you know, a lot of people attach it to the industrial revolution and the factory. What we decided was to batch process a lot of people, and okay. and and that's that's really rather than do it one at a time. We had first of all, we had more people, you know, and now when I when I grew up, there were two billion people in the world. Now there's you know four times that. So the people are just outrageous. But but the difference is we have new affordances. We have these new ways yeah. of doing things. We can so so we can say okay that was a path that we took because it was appropriate for the time, and we all got this. And now we're stuck in this. I say this all the time. We're stuck in this situation where because we all went through this batch process and it had some salubrious effects on some of us, like Barry and me and other people, then we think everybody should do that. And and because somehow and the answer is no, we're in a situation where we can now look at people much more individually. Mm -hmm. And we or we can say, what do you care about? What do you want to do? What it, what are your strengths? What motivates you? And we can put them into accomplishing and, something useful based on that. And the, that, that we're not doing. Uh, the, conund the, the conundrum is that we're not challenging okay. the values of the industrial age that brought in there. Because all that uh, was seeking efficiencies, seeking organization seeking uh, t um, challenging complexity and that simplicity and efficiency matter. The, the, the miracle of the 21st century is that complexity doesn't matter at all and that I can invert any environment and make it to the individual. We could not have done a, an Uber 20 years ago and industrial a practices would have said no way and yet the complex when you take complexity out of it then you can then we can invert the world to the individual and every individual is a strategy uh, whether they are 8 billion or not okay let's figure out good ways to say that cuz i agree with you I, and we you know it's kind of been there done that we went through a phase and now we can do something different and 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 if we want to help the the you know uh, whatever the number is i think it's 2 to 3 billion young people that are in the world not all of whom are students um the then we have to do that because that's what works for them and that's what's going to work for them. And the other thing is not working for so many of them because they drop out because they're under, you know, we all know what's what the statistics are. So um, and yet it still works for a few of them. You know, I the, the, there are plenty of people at the top at Stanford and other places for whom this stuff is working. That's that's not the problem. It's not that it doesn't work altogether. It's that it doesn't work for enough of the people that we want it to work for and that there's a, another way an alternative way. I hope it would just be a side-by-side -side decision. I love Maria Montessori because what she did was she established the fact that when your kid, if you live in certain places, when your kid gets to be six years old or so, you have to make the choice between do I want regular primary school or do I want a Montessori school? She set up that choice in the world. And that's very much what I want to do. I want to say parents and, and young people should have the choice to say, do I want to go to an academic learning and advanced school, or do I think I'd be much better suited for an accomplishment-based school and, and that or school or whatever we want to call it? And, you know, there should be some fungibility between the two, and it's not either totally either or, but but the if you go to a regular school now it's all about learning that's all it is learning in advance we measure learning we ask how much learning did you lose over the summer we we say what are the learning outcomes it's all learning and that learning is just not enough in other times that we're in it has to be accomplishment and learning as the byproduct Okay, Barry, you're going to get the last comment okay. and question, and I'm going to ask uh, Mark to, uh, to kind of summarize uh, both his thesis and his asks. 
for people who are listening in uh, both right now and uh, listening later. And we'll and then we'll thank Mark for being with us. Barry? All I wanted to say was that the point I was trying to make a little earlier with the math uh, piece of the puzzle was not that everyone should do it, but that it had a, an unexpected side effect for me. Yeah. And, and those things happen. And we want the serendipity that, that everybody uh, figures things out that they didn't understand before because they went through a particular experience. It's just that's very hard to design. And and that's the that's the problem, especially for you know eight, uh, three billion kids. So um, so I think it's much more efficient if we're going back to Ben's efficiency to say let's help individuals figure out who they are, what their strengths are, what they care about doing that, and then find paths for them that will lead them into more serendipity, that will lead them into directions. And those are flexible. They, they, it's not China where if you play ping pong at three years old, your ping pong's your life. You know, the, uh, no, we, we are, it can be a much more flexible system. Uh, I changed careers a lot of times. But still, I owe, and the reason I changed careers was to follow what I wanted to do at the time, what I thought was important for me. And and that is uh, that really, I think, works for most people in the world. Yeah, it's, it's a lot better if you can find roles than jobs. All right. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, I would say that probably 80 percent of what I do right now has nothing to do with what was delivered to me through an educational process. It was through other things that I needed to learn along the way mm -hmm. that eventually became a market basket of things that other people wanted yes. uh, and that I enjoyed, right? Because people have been paying me for my hobbies for a long time. And that's a good thing. Right. And one of the things that I that I tell young people when they're looking for this is I, I ask them, what would your friends call on you to do because you're particularly good at it? And so, you know, if enough people are saying to Kevin, run the run the 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 seminar, run the thing, run the shop, then he might say, oh, yeah. And then if he if he if he's good at that and he likes to do it. And he likes to do it because those are not congruent necessarily. But if you, those two things are there, then you have a, a path that you can start taking. And then you take it through trying it a lot in different projects. By the way, that is my favorite job interview question, right? Is what do your friends and family call on you, right? When they need something, what do they ask you for? That's right? we're because we're separated at birth, Kevin. Yeah, I mean that at, at the end of the day, um, that gets to immediately to the core of are they asking for you know some task, some type of knowledge, some emotional you know quality, yes. you know it, what they bring to that person, what they ask for, um, is a huge indicator of whether they're going to culturally fit on on the team. In any event, um, absolutely. Let's uh, uh, have a uh, a summary and what do you need? right from the PCI um, you know, community to make this uh, work in your opinion? So I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for people who just think this is a good idea and will say, what can I do? How can I help? I want to be part of this. And those can be uh, any people around the world. I'm looking for people, second, who are doing this already. And there are lots of people who are doing this, whether they're Boys and Girls Clubs or 4-H or, or organizations in different countries uh, that are happening, because I don't want to form a brand. I want to form an umbrella, a coalition. And the third is I'm looking for people who have money to fund something who don't think they know everything about education, who think who are open to saying, well, maybe there is a different way to approach this. Maybe we can approach it from an accomplishment perspective rather than just a learning perspective. And they want to put their, their uh, money and resources into a new way of thinking. So if that's the case for anyone, uh, mark at eai-institute.org or eai-institute.org on the web. And I would love to hear from you. Well, Mark Prinsky, thank you so much for being our guest and for being a member of the, the People-Centered Internet. Greatly appreciate you unpacking that for us. 
and uh, we wish you all the best on the journey to uh, making it real. All the best to everyone who joined today and listening in later and everything you do, be intentional. Take My care. My pleasure. Talk soon.